It's the Easter season, everyone, and we're looking toward celebrating the most important event that ever took place in history. And I'm thankful that you're paying attention, you're watching, you're tuning in to our uh, video each week, and I trust that uh, God's using this. I, I pray that He is. I, I, as I've said many times, as I pray, I realize that I ask God for the help I need to be able to communicate and to teach His Word effectively. And without His provision for my life, that's impossible. I am not capable of doing things without the help of God's Holy Spirit. And I pray for His uh, strengthening. I pray for strengthening for you and for uh, just the ministry of our church. And uh, I want to open here with that prayer, and then we're going to dig in. We're looking at Mark chapter 14. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking in the Gospel of Mark, considering the Easter message, the Easter story. And uh, I just want us to be able to see it from a clear perspective as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection, the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please bow with me as I pray in preparation for this message this week. So thank you. Help me pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your provisions for us. I thank you for the fact you've given us your word. And we have the teaching of your word, uh, or actually the, the revelation of your word. And that enables us to teach your word to those around us. And I pray that we will be able to communicate the wondrous truth of the gospel message, especially during this special season, the season where we celebrate all that Jesus Christ accomplished uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, use what is presented today, Father, to encourage our faith, to strengthen our relationship with you, to enable us to see opportunities that surround us because we are your servants, you're, you, we are your witnesses. You have called us to be uh, the church and the church is your messengers. We are your messengers for uh, our culture, our society. And I pray that we can effectively communicate the goodness and the grace that you've shown us that we can point to your mercy, we can point to your love, we can point to the fact that Jesus Christ was willing to pay the penalty on the cross for every one of us. He died in our places. And I thank you for that, Father, and I pray that this, this, this message today will be clear and it will point to uh, the Lord's, Lord's table presentation, the Lord's table celebration that we have at the end of this service. And I pray now that you'll guide us and lead us and help us. And I thank you. I praise you. I love you. I ask your blessing upon everyone that is listening and everyone that is part of our church fellowship. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said amen, right? Well, hey, I mentioned in my prayer, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of this service and the end of this sermon. And I might encourage you pause the video right now if you don't have your preparations made with the, the grape juice or something appropriate to drink and the bread that represents the body of Christ. And, and get that ready if you would. Pause the video and uh, let me get started as I try to present from Mark chapter 14. Now I said before and I say this repeatedly, I'll say this many times over the next few weeks, the Easter celebration is the, it's the highlight of the Christian calendar. It is the most important thing that we ever recognize, that Christ came and died on the cross, paid the price for me and for you and for each one of us, and that um, in paying that price, he was buried, he arose from the dead, and now he's ascended in heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we recognize that. We celebrate that. And I want us to be able to see today from Mark's perspective, we're looking at Mark throughout this whole series of, of studies that we'll do over these next few weeks. From Mark's perspective, I want us to understand that, that Jesus Christ was in total control. He was in complete control over everything that took place 
during that time where he was uh, taken in by the Roman soldiers, by the Jewish leaders, where he was arrested, where he was tried, a, a mock trial, of course, but Jesus Christ was in charge. Nothing caught him by surprise. He was never seen or should never be seen as a victim. He suffered in, in, our, in our behalf. He was victimized by our sin, yes, but he did that as part of God's plan and purpose. God had a reason why Christ came. He came to be our Lord and Savior. And I want us to see that. And the main emphasis as we look at Mark chapter 14 today, we're going to read the passage as we go through our study. The main emphasis of our study today is that even though evil people persecuted and plotted against Jesus, evil people persecuted and plotted against Jesus, he was never a victim. His death was voluntary. And it's, it fulfilled God's prophetic purpose for us and for what Scripture teaches. And he, Jesus, presented himself as our Passover lamb. We're going to look at that aspect today and realize what that all in, involves. He's our Passover lamb. And I think that is something significant about Easter that sometimes we don't recognize. We don't always see that the way we should. He's our Passover lamb. It's interesting, Jesus was never called the, 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 the sacrifice for the Day of Atonement. He was, in a certain sense, he symbolized that in the book of Hebrews, yes, once for all. But the scriptures describe Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. Those of us that are in our time frame today, he, he suffered on our part for that we'd be rescued, rescued, from the slavery of sin. And the Egyptians, they held this, the, the Israelite people in slavery back in that day, and the Passover rescued them from that slavery. And we need to see that. We need to understand that. We're going to look at that today. So follow along as I now begin with what I call the seven realities. The seven realities that help us recognize that Jesus was orchestrating everything that led up to his death. The seven realities <clears throat> that help us recognize that, <clears throat> that Jesus was orchestrating everything that led up to his death. And that's in Mark chapter 14. And as, you know, as, as we go through, <clears throat> let me just point out, I'll go piece by piece through Mark 14, and I'll give a point for every portion of the text. Because the first point is, there was a plot, a plot that was being planned by the Jewish leaders. Listen as I read this passage, this section, these first two verses of Mark 14. A plot, or the plot that was pl being planned by the Jewish leaders. We read in that passage, Now the Passover and the and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him, how to capture him by stealth, secretly, and to kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, the Passover festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. And as we look at that, that plot by the Jewish leaders, let's realize they were trying to take Jesus secretly and to capture him and then kill him. They didn't want him to die on the cross. They didn't want him to die by the Roman authorities. They wanted him to die basically so they could just literally get rid of him. That was their plan, to do it secretly, to do it by stealth as the scriptures say. And they had this plan that they had all set up, but they were trying to figure out, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do to make this happen? They were sinners, very much powerful, political people, Jewish leaders, and they had a secret plot 
that they were setting up. Now we, we look on in the passage and the next thing we're going to see in, um, in verses 3 through 9 of Mark 14, we're going to see the perfume, the perfume that provoked Judas. And I want us to see it in that perspective because you know what? This section now goes out of the sequence of what happened chronologically. This was two days what we read earlier, verses 1 and 2, two days before the Passover. Now, what we're re re reading now took place a week before the Passover. It took a case a week before the Passover, and it says in, in, in verses 3 through 9, Previously, while Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. And some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them according to your desires. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial Truly, I say to you, when the gospel is preached to the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. This is the perfume that provoked Jesus because it says the, 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 the people around Jesus, they scolded her. And one of them that scolded her was Judas. But we find that the other disciples agreed with Judas. They, 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 there was peer pressure there and they recognized this doesn't make sense. They're wasting this expensive perfume. Why are they doing that? Possibly the Jewish leaders were saying the same thing. But yet Judas, the keeper of the treasury for the disciples, he was a crook. And he saw the amount of money that that perfume was worth. And he's thinking, hey, if I'd have had that, I could have sold it. He probably thought I could have stolen some more to be my embezzling process and all that part of my embezzling process and, and Judas was provoked by the perfume and he was provoked because we read in this next section then the promise that led to a hypocritical kiss the promise that led to a hypocritical hypocritical kiss remember when Jesus betrayed when Jesus was betrayed by Judas what did he say to the Roman officials and to the Jewish leaders you'll know who he is by the one that I go and kiss and Judas received a promise from the Jewish leaders and we read this in this passage the next few verses which we find in verses 10 through 11 then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. This was six days, seven days before the Passover, not two days. This was already before, or several days before. And it says, they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began looking, began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time, at a perfect time, at a time that fit with the Jewish leaders. And, and that was an interesting aspect because Judas understood what their plan was, and he probably agreed, let's do it secretly. I think Judas didn't want to be found out. And he, he took this promise that he would receive money, and that led to a hypocritical kiss. He would, he would define Jesus, point Jesus out by kissing him. So, next thing we see is that there's a private preparation for the Passover. A private preparation, or the private preparation for the Passover. The Passover now, we're coming up, it is the day of, the day when the sacrifice is to be made of the Passover lamb. 
And the passage says, verses 12 through 16 of Mark 14, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, many Passover lambs were being sacrificed there in the temple region, his disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two, not twelve, not three, not Judas. He sent two of the disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And whenever he in, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, the rabbi says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself, the, the man that owns the house, will show you a large upper room furnished and ready Prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it exactly as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. It's interesting. What Jesus did here is he did this secretly. He did this privately. The Jews were plotting secretly to seize Jesus. Jesus knew that. He was not caught off guard. He knew what was going on. Jesus even knew about Judas. We'll see that in a few moments. But yet, what we find in that is there was a private preparation by Jesus for the Passover. Why? Because he knew what Judas was doing. And he knew that Judas, along with the Jews, were looking for a time to seize him when no one else was there. And no, no one could stop what was going on. And Jesus said, that's not going to happen. Because I want us to realize, once again, Jesus had complete control over everything that was taking place. The Jews had their plans. Many people, we have plans sometimes, but we have to ask, does this fit with God's plan? And Jesus, he had a private preparation. He'd probably made the arrangements with this person, and yet he sent the disciples to prepare the Passover, and they did. They found it exactly as he had said. Now, the next section, verses 17 through 21, it shows us the persuasive push. The persuasive push that prompted Judas' actions. Judas thought he had everything in place. He thought, I've got the money, I've got the promise. I've got the plan that I will... I will bring the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers that they were going to use to Jesus to arrest him. Judas was a crook. He was an evil man. And yet he was one of the 12 chosen by Jesus. That wasn't a mistake. That wasn't something that Jesus did thinking, well, I'll just take 12 men. No, he took Judas on purpose. He knew what Judas was doing. He knew what Judas was going to do. And we read this passage where there's a persuasive push that prompted Judas' actions. Listen as I read. It says, When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me now. They began to be grieved and to say to one Say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, the one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born." Now, what I want to do is I want to read from a section here. I got to find my, my other notes. A section from John, John chapter 13. The disciples are asking, you know, who is it? And Mark gives us that one perspective that I just read. John gives us more information. And we get this information from John. They're asking, is it I, is it I, is it I? And Jesus replied, 
John 13, verse 26, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread after I've dipped it in the dish. Then he dipped the piece of bread in the dish and gave it to Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. And after Judas took the bread, the piece of bread, Satan entered into him, spiritual warfare. Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you were about to do, do quickly. Judas wasn't planning to do it then, but Jesus, he persuaded him, the persuasive push that prompted Judas's actions. Judas took the piece of bread and went out immediately. Now it was night. So we know from John that Judas left before they celebrated the Passover. Judas wasn't there. And he received this persuasive push from Jesus. Why? Jesus was in total control. Jesus had a plan that he was carrying out. It was God Almighty's plan. And Jesus understood exactly what had to happen. He knew the Jewish leaders were planning to do it secretly and to do it at a time not during the Passover. They were going to arrest him. They were going to hold him. And then after the Passover, they were going to secretly assassinate him. And that wasn't going to happen. Jesus knew he was going to die publicly on the cross with a Roman crucifixion. Everyone would see, everyone would realize, and Jesus also knew he would rise from the dead, obviously. But that persuasive push prompted Judas to thwart the plan of the Jewish people, of the Jewish leaders. Judas' plans were changed, and suddenly he had to do something that he wasn't actually planning to do. I don't suspect, I don't believe that Judas was going to be suicidal in light of his original plan. But because of what happened, and when Jesus entered into this and persuaded him by surprising him and pointing him out to the other disciples, Judas realized that he was a cooked crook, so to speak that he didn't have everything in place like he thought. But now, we find that the very next thing that happens is that Jesus, he carries out the Passover meal. They eat the Passover meal. There's a lot to that meal. I'm not going to explain all that in this message because what we find in the passage, the next few verses, is the presentation by Jesus of the Passover lamb. And Jesus Christ does not call himself the Lamb of Atonement or the Sacrifice of Atonement. He calls himself the Passover Lamb. We'll see what he does as he carries this out, as he shifts the attention of the Passover meal. He presents himself as the Passover Lamb. Follow as I read verses 22 through 25. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. After a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. Just like in the Passover meal, this is my body. And the Passover meal was unleavened bread. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is the blood, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. Truly I say to you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in, drink it new in the kingdom of God. And Jesus presents himself as the Passover lamb. He expresses the bread, the unleavened bread, that's my body, my perfect body. Unleavened bread represented without sin. The blood represents, or the, the, the cup represents the blood of, of sacrifice that cleanses from sin. And Jesus presented himself as our Passover lamb. But now we've got one more section of the passage that I want to read. And then I want us to dig in into some applications, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. In the last portion, verses 26 through 31, 
This is the problem that plagued Peter. Now, we'll talk more about this later, but I want us to see the impact of this as we look at this passage and understand how it all fits together. It's the problem that plagued Peter because Jesus then says to the disciples, let's go. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet not I, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, Peter, that this very night before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter, Peter kept saying ins insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny, deny you. And they all, the rest of the disciples, the other 10 disciples, were all saying the same thing also. We will never deny you. We will never leave you. Now, prophecy said that the lamb would be struck and the disciples would be scattered for a time. But they said, no, that'll never happen. We will not deny you. We know the story. We'll read that later. Peter did deny Jesus. But as we look at this passage, as we look at all this, what do we see here as far as a practical response for us to understand what is this telling us? And as we begin to celebrate the Lord's Supper, what is this saying to us as we think about the body and the blood of Christ? What is the practical response that we should see here? And I think we could call this first thing maybe the power of sin, yes, the power of sin, but rather I've got it in a different framework. It's the power of sin, but recognize the power of peer pressure. Recognize the power of peer pressure. Judas, the other disciples didn't know that Judas was a crook. They didn't understand that Jesus, Judas was someone that could not be trusted. In the power of peer pressure, when the perfume was poured out a week before, Judas, he insisted, this is not good. This could be sold for a great price and we could give to the poor. And Jesus responds, hey, you've always got the poor with you. What this lady's done was very something, something very special because what happened here, Judas convinced the other disciples that the perfume was a waste. He said, this is a waste. And they believed him. Even though, as Jesus expressed this, it was an act of adoration that prepared Jesus' body for burial. It was an act of adoration by this lady that prepared Jesus' body for burial. And Jesus says, she'll be remembered for this. But peer pressure caused the disciples to listen to Judas the crook rather than Jesus the Christ. And they didn't understand. Peer pressure is a powerful tool that is oftentimes used by the adversary. It's used by those that tempt us to do things that we ought not to do. The power of peer pressure, but we also should recognize not only the power of peer pressure in that element, but the way that Peter, at the end of the story here, Peter promised that he would never deny Jesus. He made a promise he could not keep. And it's interesting to note the other disciples all pledged the same thing. The, 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 the power of peer pressure, how we're affected by the crowd we're with, how we're affected by the things that are being said, how we're affected by what's going on around us. And Peter made a promise he couldn't keep. He broke the promise. And in a sense, that almost broke Peter. But fortunately, fortunately, Jesus, we know the story later, Jesus came and restored Peter. But the other disciples all pledged, pledged the same thing. And we should be careful about the pledges we make. Should we be careful about the, the peer pressure of doing what others do or thinking we need to be like other people? Let's realize there's a power 
in the persuasion of people. The world is persuading us in many ways, and let's realize that. Let's understand that. And as we partake in the Lord's Supper, let's realize that this isn't something we just go through the motions and do. This is something that is very important. Jesus himself changed the Passover meal to the Lord's Supper, but yet as he did that, he presented himself as the Passover lamb, our Passover lamb who rescues us from the slavery, just like the Israelites were rescued from the slavery in Egypt. But now secondly, we need to be realizing how God's plans and purposes can never be prevented. God's plans and purposes can never be prevented. God has plans and purposes and they will not be thwarted. God can never be stopped by people's plans or by anything else. We have a sovereign God who's in charge. Jesus Christ was sovereignly in charge. He was in complete control, complete charge of everything that took place leading up to his death. And he was in complete control over all that happened. And the Jewish leaders' plans were being halted and hindered. They had a plan. They had a good plan, actually. They paid Judas. They got Judas to betray Jesus. Yet their plans were halted and hindered. And Judas wasn't able to fulfill the Jewish people's plans because Jesus wasn't, according to their plan, to be sacrificed or to be killed during the Passover feast. They were going to do it secretly later. But the Jewish plans were halted and hindered. And therefore, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as in Mark expresses this, and let's realize the priorities of the Lord's Supper. The priorities that are involved in celebrating the Lord's Supper. Number one, Jesus presented himself as our Passover lamb. It represents to us the freedom we have from the slavery of sin. And I'll go into that a little bit more here in, in a few moments. But Jesus presented himself as the Passover lamb. And let's realize that that's what was happening there. The Jews had celebrated this year after year after year, and suddenly Jesus shifted the attention from Egypt and the Israelites to followers of Christ, the disciples of Christ, who received the freedom and the forgiveness that was available from the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, as long as the blood of Christ is covering our lives. And we, we, we realize he presented himself. Now, as we consider the different pieces of this, let's realize the bread represents his perfect sinless body. His perfect sinless body. Jesus Christ never sinned once. That's why he was able to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sin. His perfect sinless body. And the unleavened bread, it, des it describes it. It symbolizes the idea that the sin, the sin has been cleaned out. Let me read something else here for a moment. From 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Don't get lost in the details here. I'm going to emphasize the things that need to be seen. It says to Paul, Paul's writing to the Corinthians, it is actually reported that sexual immorality exists among you. It does amongst us too. There's sin around us. The kind of immorality that should not be permitted even among those outside the church. That's Paul writing. We should realize there's much sin that happens in lives around us, sometimes in our own lives, and we should say that's, that's wrong. Now, Paul warns and says, you've become arrogant and apathetic. Shouldn't you have been deeply sorrowful instead of, and, and, instead, and removed the one who has done this sinful act from among you? Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast affects the whole lump of dough, the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch of dough, you are in fact without yeast. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 
We can have freedom and forgiveness from sin, and we need to clean out the, the, the sinful aspects of our lives. It says, So then, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of vice and evil, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. The bread represents the, the perfect, sinless body of Christ. The unleavened bread, the sin has been cleaned out. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we should make personal preparation. Personal preparation by examining our attitude, or our attitudes, individually, my attitude, your attitude, collectively, our attitudes, we should examine our attitudes, we should examine our actions, and we should examine our affections. What are the things that we love the most? What are the things that, that are our pursuits of our life? And when we do that, we recognize we are preparing ourselves for the Lord's Supper. And that's important because the unleavened bread represents the sinless body, the perfect body of Christ that was nailed to the cross for our sins. And we're taking of that bread, remembering he was perfect. He was the only one that could pay the price. And his body was nailed to the cross. But secondly, we realize, or finally we realize, his blood paid the penalty for our sin. His blood cleanses us free, it cleanses us clean from the, the penalties of, of sin, the guilt of sin. 1 John 1 says that, you know, the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin. We confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And his blood paid the penalty for our sins. We are pardoned. We are pardoned. God gave us a pardon because of our faith in Jesus Christ, our trusting in Christ. And we have forgiveness and we have freedom. And we celebrate the Lord's Supper in recognition of that wondrous blessing we have in Christ. So pray with me as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, please. Father God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the freedom we have through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness we have through Jesus Christ, his perfect body nailed to the cross, his sinless blood paying the penalty, covering us, cleansing us from our sin, our sin and guilt. Thank you, Father, for that. As we stop and take of the Lord's Supper now, as we realize what it means to us, Father, help us to understand that preparation is important, that we should be prepared, regularly prepared on a consistent basis, stopping and confessing our sins before you, stopping and recognizing that through you and through you alone are we given the freedom and the forgiveness, the pardon that we have, because Christ paid the penalty for our sins. Help us to stop and examine attitudes, actions, and affections. To look at ourselves and see, okay, am I being all that you want me to be? Am I a representative that reaches out to a world around us? And people might say, yes, there's a difference. Father, help us in this moment. Pre -pre Prepare us. Provide for us the understanding we need and help us to look at you and realize the praise we should be giving, the thanksgiving that is yours, because, Father, you've provided for us in a very special way. We love you and thank you for this reminder, this reminder that Jesus Christ gave us on that, that, that night in the upper room. And we celebrate it now for the, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your honor, and for the strengthening of our faith. For the strengthening of our witness, Father, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, on that night when Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave a blessing. He thanked God for it. Father God, I do thank you. I thank you for the body of Christ, 
that this bread represents. I thank you that he was able, he alone was able to pay the penalty, to pay the price, because his body was perfect. It was sinless. It was never tainted in any fashion. Thank you, Father, for that reminder. Thank you for this unleavened bread. I pray that this symbolizes for us the reminder that we have, that we have a perfect Savior. And we have the pardon that's available through Christ. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. We'll take and eat the bread together. Now, it says in the passage, it says that um, then he had taken a cup and he gave thanks. Once again, the cup, let's give thanks. Father, thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for the fact that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin, but Jesus Christ was willing to shed his blood voluntarily. He's not a victim. He's a volunteer. He's the only volunteer that could ever do what he did. And he shed his blood on our behalf. Thank you that we have the remission of sins, the forgiveness, the freedom that is ours through Christ. Use what we do now, Father, as we drink this, this cup, as we recognize this cup. Help it to strengthen us, to strengthen our resolve to serve you effectively. Father, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus took the cup that night. He gave it to the disciples, and they each drank from it. And he said, this <clears throat> is my blood of the covenant, of the agreement that is poured out for many. Jesus sacrificed in our place. His blood cleanses us, and we drink together. I hope this wasn't just a routine. I hope this was something that causes us to pause and to reflect and to remember what Christ did for us, what Christ means to us, his perfect body, his sacrificial blood that pays for us, that gives us the guarantee of heaven and we know that someday we will all enjoy the benefits and the blessings of what Christ accomplished for us. Thanks for listening today. Thanks for watching. I look forward to seeing you in person, like I said, I've said many times. I pray that each person that's a part of our fellowship, that they'll be strengthened by the ministries that we carry on, the various volunteers that help with Awana, with Bible studies, with other ministries, the meals ministries, the other things, the prayer ministries, the prayer chain, the prayer reminders in the bulletin now each week. All these things, the, we, we, we're a ministry that's seeking to give honor and glory to God and to make a difference in this community. So thanks for being part. Keep praying for us. And I just, just ask now that, that you will... Uh, uh, consistently pray for the, the strengthening and the ongoing work of our ministry as we wait for Christ to come and, and take us to heaven, either from the grave or from being alive when he comes and we meet him in the clouds. Regardless, we're looking forward to the day and we're celebrating the, the, day that, the, the, the time that made that possible. We're celebrating the Easter season now over these next few weeks. Lord bless and look forward to seeing you soon.